This is my attempt at a historic pirate rum. And this video is going to be all about explaining what on earth that even means, how I made it, and of course, what the stuff tastes like. How's it going, chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. So rum's association with pirates has turned into this corny and, I mean, let's face it, cheap marketing ploy within the rum world, which is sad. It's really sad because good rum by itself, it, it, it doesn't need anything. It can tell its own story. And it really is a category of spirits that's kind of, it, it struggles sometimes to get the recognition that it really deserves. But as a larger idea out there in the wild, I think this connection between pirates and rum persists and is popular because the whole thing just gets romanticized. The modern idea, the modern aesthetic of a pirate, it, it's just cool. And we all love that underdog outlaw story. The whole thing is just kind of irresistible. And the connection between that and rum is just, it's easy, it's seamless for the public mind. But if you strip all of that away, the, the point of this video is were pirates and rum actually a thing? And if they were actually a thing, how was that rum made? What was it made from? And what I really want to know, can I make something similar here in my shed? Or is this whole thing just a Hollywood story with a cool aesthetic? Speaking of cool aesthetics, it's time to talk about today's sponsor, Clocks and Colors. They make a whole bunch of really cool rings, bracelets, uh, and necklaces for guys and girls. But if you're into that aesthetic, that look that I was talking about earlier on, you're going to want to check out their Privateers collection. It's pretty dope. I have the Tortuga and the North Star. The good news is that you can win a $500 gift card to spend on their website and all you need to do is comment on this video uh, and sign up to their mailing list with the link in the description down below. The even better news is that everyone that signs up gets a $40 gift card to spend and uh, hopefully you're the one that ends up with the 500 bucks. To get started on this project, I think it would be smart to nail down a time and a place in history and the obvious choice for me is the golden age of piracy in the Caribbean. And the reason for that is that, at least loosely, I think this is what springs to people's mind when you mention the word pirate or piracy. There seems to be some historic debate about exactly when the golden age of piracy began and exactly when it finished, but what does seem clear is that, say, between 1660 and the very beginning of the 18th century, piracy was at its peak in the Caribbean. So there were pirates in the Caribbean in that time period. Well, what about rum? Uh, luckily, I talked to Matt Petrick recently and recorded a podcast with him. He is a rum historian, and I learned a bunch. If you're interested in the history of Navy rum, check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, but I did manage to learn a bunch of really interesting stuff that pertains specifically to this video. The earliest reference we have to cane spirits comes from Brazil back in the 1500s. Uh, and interestingly, cane itself, the sugar cane, came to the Caribbean area in the 1500s, but we don't see cane spirits popping up in the Caribbean until something more like 1630 or 1640, where they showed up in Martinique and Barbados. In 1655, the Brits kicked the Spaniards out, and while it wasn't exactly clear whether or not the Spanish were producing rum before they left, uh, as soon as the Brits took over, they definitely started production. By 1687, the British Royal Navy was officially allowed to restock their supplies with rum while they were in the Caribbean. And by around 1700, the Caribbean rum was starting to make its way back to Europe via trade. So yes, there 100% was definitely rum in the area at that time. So I guess really the goal of this video was something like how to make a mid to late 17th century Caribbean rum. You gotta have those clickable YouTube titles though, eh? <laughs> so let's start with ingredients. And to do that, I think we need to understand that the, the main goal of sugarcane is not rum, it's sugar, especially at that time. So if you take cane juice and you keep boiling it, sugar precipitates out as the uh, moisture level in the, the juice drops. And if you keep doing it until you can't take any more sugar out, you're left with molasses. Molasses is essentially a waste product, a byproduct of producing sugar. And by the mid 1600s, the people of the Caribbean had figured out how to upscale that waste stream into rum. So for my pirate rum, I decided to make it with blackstrap molasses. And this is the molasses that's had 
the most sugar taken out of it. Uh, it is the least desirable molasses. In fact, you know, often it's used for animal feed and stuff like that. But I may have made a slight mistake here. The technology used to extract sugar from cane juice now is a lot better than it used to be. So the amount of sugar that can be taken out of molasses is much higher. Blackstrap molasses might have something like 45% sugar. Back then it probably would have been something more like 60 to 75%. So maybe, maybe I should have chosen like a standard molasses, not a blackstrap molasses. I don't know, I'm still undecided on that. You guys tell me what you think. But molasses is not the only thing that can provide fermentable sugars around a sugar plantation. In fact, very few, if any, of the rums made in that time would have been made with molasses only. As the cane juice was boiled in the process of making sugar, skimmings would be taken off the top. You know, so the scum would rise to the top and they'd skim it off. This had a whole lot of fermentable sugar in it and that was often used in rum as well. Along with, honestly, anything else with fermentable sugar in it. Maybe they had some semi-discarded cane juice laying around or whatever. Unfortunately, unfortunately, here in New Zealand, fresh cane is just not available and I even looked for, you know, like bottled cane juice or something like that to, to be able to imitate this kind of thing. I just couldn't find it. I thought about adding, you know, other cane products, some sort of sugar back in. I just didn't feel right about that. So at the end, I used just blackstrap molasses, seven and a half kilos of the stuff, in fact. Next up, Water. Molasses is so thick and so concentrated that you're not going to be able to ferment it unless you dilute it back down with something. But water was, let's just say, not exactly as easy to get hold of <laughs> as it is for most of us nowadays. The Caribbean distillers had worked out that they could take some of the stuff that was left in the still from the last distillation, combine that with water and use it to dilute the molasses down, saving themselves a little bit of water. This dunder also affected the pH of the mash, making it more acidic, which wasn't actually a bad thing. That acidity helps to stave off some of the nastier microbes that could take over in the wash, and it can actually add improved flavor over time as well. Luckily, I had bottled up some dunder from my last rum distillation, so I used five liters of boiling water, my dunder had gone cold already, to help dissolve the molasses, I added five liters of dunder or backset from the last rum distillation, and topped the whole thing up to 25 liters in total, aiming for right around 30 degrees Celsius for temperature. Now keep in mind guys that this is what some people would now call backset, not dunder. It doesn't have anything growing in it, it's not muck. You could assume that wild yeast was just making its way into these washes. That's totally plausible. Perhaps, on the other hand, they were using something kind of like a Scandinavian magic stick. To be honest, I couldn't find much evidence one way or the other. But what is abundantly clear is there would have been a huge variation of different yeasts fermenting rum. So I could have used a baker's yeast propagated on molasses, and in terms of just making something tasty, that probably actually wouldn't have been a bad option. But instead, I decided to go with Distiller Max RM. I did so because it was specifically selected to ferment rum agricole, and more importantly, it was taken from the tropics. Does that mean anything? No, <laughs> probably not, but it makes me feel a little bit better. I'm just not going to be able to get the same yeast they had then. Interestingly enough, uh, there are reports from some other home distillers out there that this Distiller Max RM stuff ends up tasting like poop. Literally, the odor of human shit <laughs> can show up when using Distiller Max RM. Did you know that there is evidence to show that at least sometimes, sometimes, human excrement was added into the rum washers to stop the slaves from consuming it before it could be distilled. Stop and think about that for a second. That is messed up on so many different levels. And this is going to be messed up too. Sorry guys, I, I couldn't go. I... Stage Friday. You try pooping on camera and then tell me what it's like. I couldn't do it, so sorry, this isn't going to be overly realistic. But, oh, also, spoiler alert, my Distiller Max RM didn't end up smelling like poop. No shit smell. I don't know why. I don't know the difference between my results and their results, but there you have it. <laughs>
What I did do, however, was ferment this without an airlock, exposed to the environment, and I let it go for another 10 days past the end of primary fermentation, just to let the wild stuff that was in there take off just a little bit, sour things up just a little bit, and obviously, no, it's not gonna be the same stuff that was available in the Caribbean in 1673 or whatever, but you get the idea, right? It's finally, finally time to distill this stuff, uh, but what sort of stills, techniques, technology would they have used? This is actually pretty easy, simply because the column still, the retort still, the double retort still, all of these things hadn't been invented yet, so it's good old fashioned double pot stilling, baby. Their stills would have been made almost exclusively from copper, perhaps some parts made from wood. Uh, my stills have a whole lot of stainless steel going on, but I have added uh, a lot more copper to the vapor path to try and more closely imitate what those early stills would have done to the spirit. It's also probably important for me to point out that the still, yes, it is just running as a pot still. I know some of these parts look like uh, column or, or bubble paint, plate parts, but the, all the internals have been taken out of them, they're just literally acting as a pipe uh, and holding some of that copper mesh. I did the first distillation or the stripping run on my 50 litre pot still. Uh, at this point in time, I'm not really worried about exactly how I'm controlling the still too much. Uh, I'm not worried about the flavours that are coming off and no cuts uh, performed at this point in time. We're just cutting volume down uh, and raising the ABV ready for the spirit run or the second distillation. Generally, generally what would happen is you would do this step multiple times to collect up enough low wines from stripping runs to put back into the still and perform the spirit run. Or uh, what you can do is use a smaller spirit still than stripping still or wash still, which is what I decided to do. I used my little, relatively mini claw hammer pot still. During the second distillation, power input is monitored a little bit more closely, <laughs> which reminds me guys, uh, back in the 1600s you didn't have a little dial to adjust the amount of power you're putting or energy you're putting into the still. That shit's done with fire. And that is, that's tricky. You gotta give respect to that because molasses based washes are notorious for being unruly and puking. This is what happened to me during my first run. I managed to catch it in time and knock the power down quickly enough uh, to avert making a big old mess and ruining my day. But uh, imagine having to do that with fire. Now Matt assured me that the distillers in this period would have understood, at least at some level, the idea of making cuts. Exactly how tight or wide they were making those cuts, that's really not obvious to me. And this is, <laughs> this is probably biased and pride speaking, but I would like to think that I'm a little bit more picky than they were. I mean, I live in a world where spirits are a luxury, I do this purely for enjoyment, I'm not trying to make a profit off it, I don't have to worry about volume. I also live in a world that is full of reviewers and critics and, and all of that sort of stuff. That just wasn't true back then, it was very, very different. It's also true that a lot of very old rums, perhaps not quite this old, have survived and people that have enough money to be able to taste them can taste them uh, and they seem to think that they were pretty good. So short story long, I basically decided to, to make cuts similar to what I would normally do in this situation, but I squeezed them out just a smidge. I went a little, little bit wider. I let a little bit more heads through and a little bit more tails through than I normally would. So now we have a distilled spirit and I've got to decide what proof to, to set this at, which is, which is kind of tricky because honestly rum was used in a lot of different ways back then. Remember that, that clean drinking water wasn't just flowing from taps <laughs> freely. Uh, so it was often mixed with water uh, to, to make dubious water stretch a little bit further if that makes sense. In the end I decided to go with storing it at proof, British proof, so 57.5% uh, or uh, in American contemporary, what's that, 115 proof. The idea being that that was a concept of the time um, and I have to assume that it would make more sense to, to store it at a higher ABV, more concentrated, a smaller volume, uh, and then dole it out and proof it down to what you wanted on the spot. That's what I decided to do. Uh, but, 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 what about wood? What about wood aging? So while storing spirits in wooden vessels was totally a thing, it, it, it wasn't a, a concept of maceration or barrel aging. It was just a, it was a means to an end. We need to put the stuff somewhere, we put it in the barrel to transport it or hold it uh, until we need it, we pull it out and we drink it. That's about all it was. So it was, in the barrel for as long as it was in the barrel for, uh, and on top of that, 
the, the same barrels would have been used over and over and over again. We, they weren't choosing barrels based on the flavor it was going to impart. Uh, they just didn't want to spend money on new barrels. So every time the barrel was filled and emptied, it would have a little bit less impact on the next spirit that went into it. So I am not going to macerate this or age it. What I am going to do, however, uh, is put a little bit of a X red wine barrel uh, into this bottle. With the idea being that if I drink it quickly, then um, it's going to have very, very little effect on the spirit. If it ends up sitting and being forgotten for a while, like perhaps some barrels were back then, uh, then maybe it's going to have a little bit more influence. Uh, and when I inevitably make this again and refill the bottle, it'll be the same, same wood doing the work on the spirit over and over again. That just kind of seems fitting to me. But I'm guessing uh, we're at the point now where you guys want to know what this stuff actually tastes like. So let's get stuck in. Oh, by the way, uh, these Chase the Craft Glen Cairn glasses available at chasethecraft.com if you're interested. But before we do that, I need to say a huge, huge thank you. A huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, guys, for being the ones that are uh, the core crew that really, really meaningfully support the channel. I, I, I can't say a big enough thank you to you. I really do appreciate it. The first thing that is notable is that I still have a, a, a bit of a cold. Sorry guys, family's all been sick, so um, I'll do what I can. All joking aside, the first thing that jumps out is just molasses. It, it still smells like molasses. It has that heady rum thing going onto it, that sweetness. That sweetness mixed with a darker, deeper, fuller, grungier flavor. It's not funk, coffee, chocolate, toffee, caramel, all the way through to like borderline marmite or soy sauce. Almost there, but not quite. Uh, less, less of the kind of tropical uh, fruit notes that I've had in a lot of other rums. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is cut wider than I would normally cut, and it's served at 57%, and it's straight off the still uh, yesterday. So it is going to slap you around <laughs> a little bit, that's for sure. All of the flavor descriptors that I gave before are there present and uh, accountable on the palate as well. Along with a, a interesting kind of vegetal note, almost Paspalin-esque, you know, the, the long thin pieces of grass that stereotypically you see silly photos of farmers with in their mouths for some reason. Like if you actually do that and chew on it, it kind of tastes like that. I think that that will disappear over the next week or two of it sitting in the bottle. That's just my experience with those sorts of flavors. Who knows though? The question arises, what is the conclusion to all of this video? Uh, yes, there were pirates and rum in the same location at the same time. Did pirates drink rum? I mean, I'm sure they did. <laughs> they had access to it. I get the feeling they were an unruly bunch and they would have had no problem drinking large amounts of rum. Uh, did they specifically like rum more than other stuff? I'm sure that all pirates had their own personal preferences. <laughs> Was I able to make a rum in my shed that accurately, accurately represents rum from that time? Uh, I'd say I gave it a good old college try. It is what it is. I think I gave it a pretty good nudge with what I had available to me, but you guys let me know. Uh, tell me in the comments down below what you think. I'm sure during the course of this video I've managed to piss off uh, a rum expert and a historian. Uh, if you are one of those people, by all means, if I've made a mistake, put a comment in the comment section down below. This has been a whole lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I certainly did. I'm going to enjoy having this spirit around the house. If you enjoyed the video too, do the YouTube-y things, drop a comment in the comment section down below, that really helps me out. Hit the like button, make sure you sub up and uh, hit the notification bell too so you don't miss out next time I put something like this out on the interwebs. I'll catch you next time guys, keep on chasing the craft. See ya.